Originally, I had titled today's message, Hold Fast, but uh, at the last minute, I, I changed the title, uh, probably number one, because I'm high maintenance, but number two, the title really, I believe, encompasses best what we're going to be dealing with today, a believing the word. This is foundational. To believe the word is so foundational, and I, I got to tell you, We make it seem easier than it is in the way we speak. But as I look out, I realize something really interesting. It's almost like you see many, many Christians attempting to grasp the wind with their hands when it comes to believing the word. This is something that is so foundational, so important. It will absolutely, if you are able to do this, you are going to walk in power. You are going to walk in wisdom. You're going to walk with the protection of the Lord at your side. And this is the reality. And so we're going to talk about believing the word. And what I want to do today is I actually want to take you to the book of Numbers. And in the book of Numbers, you have uh, this interchange between two men. Balak, he's the king of Moab, and Balaam who is a diviner. He's a man of great power. Whomever he blesses gets blessed. Whomever he curses is cursed. And Balak sees Israel. God had delivered Israel out of Egypt. They're coming out. Balak sees Israel coming. He calls for Balaam, says, come, you need to curse Israel for me. This is what you do. So he gets them to do it. Long story short, he gets them to come. And the first place he brings them is to the high places of Baal. And he takes them there. He says, curse Israel from here. And so they offer sacrifice. And he takes up an oracle. The ironic thing, instead of cursing them, he blesses Israel. Because God had blessed them. He could not curse them. Well, Balak is frustrated. He's beside himself. He says, okay, okay, you didn't curse them here. I'm going to take you to another place. We're going to go to the top of Pisgah. And that's interesting because the top of Pisgah was exactly where God took Moses to view the land. He brought him there to view all the land of Israel and say, this is the land I'm giving Israel. You won't go in. You will die here. And so this is the very place where Moses died. This is the place that Balak brought Balaam to curse Israel. And from here, you can see the outer portion of him. So Balaam takes up his oracle. Again, this time he says something that I want to draw your attention to. Absolutely critical. Then he took up his oracle and said, Rise, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, son of Zippor. What does he say here? God is not a man that he should lie. Now you have to stop and just let this sink in for a second. He is not a man that he should lie. Every single word that proceeds from the mouth of God is 100% truth. And that is a game changer. That is a game changer when I go to this book, when I go to the Bible, and I have the confidence that every single thing that comes out of his mouth is the truth. Goes on, nor son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? In other words, every single word that comes forth out of the Lord's mouth, it will come to pass. Every promise the Lord has ever made, it will be fulfilled. Every single promise. You think of Isaiah 55. The word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord, it will accomplish the thing that is sent for. It will not return to him void. Let me ask you a question. How does this reality impact you? How does this reality impact your life? And what I would say is that I guess that depends, doesn't it? It depends on whether you believe it or not. See, because this is the difference. This is life and death. If you believe it, if you don't believe it, it's the difference between forgiveness and condemnation. It's the difference of wallowing in a plague with no hope and being healed. That's how powerful this subject matter is. Very, very powerful. Well, today, I want to look at just some 
of the words of the Lord. Just some of them. And before we really get into this, I want to set the stage with a warning. A very important warning, and we're going to go back to the Garden of Eden for a moment. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, continuing on, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, in other words, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, okay? What it is, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now get this, she opens up and answering, God has said, he spoke, this is his word. And what did he tell her? Well, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge, you're going to die. This is what he said. Well, how does the devil respond? He responds this way, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Isn't that an amazing response? Okay, Eve told her, God said... Satan comes on the scene and says, that's not true. God has spoken, but he will not bring it to pass. He has said, but he will not do. He casts doubt. He brings doubt to the table. You can't trust his word, Eve. You can't trust it. Don't go there. Don't do it. Well, how did that work out for Eve? Not so good. Not trusting, believing. Getting into this concept, not believing in his words, cost her everything. And ironically enough, what Lord had said, he did. He told her, he warned her, you will die. What happened? She died. This is the point. You start looking at the words of the Lord. They cannot be broken. They are invincible. You can't change them. You can't remove them. Nobody can erase the words of the Lord. When they leave his mouth, nothing can prohibit it from accomplishing what it was sent for. This is powerful. Let me be clear on something. We look at this story, and really this story, and I've mentioned this, and I mentioned it in the series that I did. That story sets the precedent, the context for the rest of the word. The rest of the word. And what I mean by that is, the devil is coming for you. He is coming to do the exact same thing that he did to Eve. He is coming to strip you of the power of God. His power, the power of promise. All his promises that we read in this book. All the blessings. He's coming to strip you of the commandments, the wisdom, the understanding of God. This is what he is coming to do. You think about that. His word, what was it? Uh, Psalm 119, uh, verse 50. Your word has given me life. See, this is what the enemy's coming to do. What, what he came to do to Eve, to get her to disbelieve the word, he was taking life. And you think of Deuteronomy 8, 3. And what it said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How do we live? Every single word that proceeds out of his mouth, that is the only way we survive. Yes, the enemy is going to come and attempt to steal that from you. He is going to come and attempt to take that. He wants you to walk away from the promises, from the commandments, so that, you know what, you're just going to be completely left broken. So that you're left shattered in pieces. So that you're completely powerless, and you move into this land of despair. Depression starts to sink in. Fear begins to creep in and take hold of you. Anxiety begins to control you. Anyone ever been there? This is the work of Hasatan. He is coming in to destroy. He wants you to be in a state of hopelessness because he knows what all these things do. Fear and anxiety and doubt. They all combat belief, faith. Just the belief in God's word. It's, you get into that state of hopelessness, it's very, very difficult to hear God. He doesn't want, God doesn't want you in that state. He knows what it means. The devil does. Let me just give you a little example of how scary of a place this is. You know, 
God literally, going back to Exodus 6, in looking at this, the Lord, he is sending a deliverer to Israel, but they're in total bondage. They're in bondage to the Egyptians, and it's ramped up. Pharaoh has lost his mind. He is persecuting Israel at, at a level, at a degree, that they had never experienced before. Persecution, tribulation, fear, doubt. All of these things are plaguing him. But he sends the deliverer to tell them his words. Listen to me carefully. Moses goes to tell them the promises that God has spoken to them. I will take you out of this place. I will deliver you. And I will bring you to the promised land. Well, let me show you what Exodus 6, 9 has to say. And Moshe spoke thus to the children of Israel. In other words, the promises. He's going to take into the promised land. Oh, but they did not heed Moses because of the anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. They couldn't hear the words of the Lord because of all those things that the devil had planted to take over, to take control, the fear, the doubt. The trials, the tribulations, the persecutions, so that you can't hear the word, so that you won't believe. This is what he's after. He inhibited their ability to believe. It's a scary thing. You need to understand that unless you believe, truly believe with all your heart, unless you believe that what God has said he is actually going to do, neither you nor me, we will ever win the fight. We will never win the fight. We will never come out of the hole of depression. We will never come out of the hole of fear and anxiety, this bondage. The enemy will keep you there until you're totally destroyed. Totally destroyed. I want to encourage you guys today in regard to the word of the Lord and letting everything go and put everything you have Every, without even a shred of doubt in your heart, believe what he has said he will do. I want to help you with this today. I want to take you to the Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, this is his word. This is the power. The heavens were made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up deep the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Why should we stand in awe of the Lord? For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. That's why we are to stand in awe of him. He merely spoke and it was accomplished. Do, do you think when he said, let there be light, that the world, that the elements of the world went and voted on it? Or they went somehow to deliberate? Should, should, we, should, we, should we let God, let there be light? Nothing could prohibit it. The adversary could not prohibit light coming into the world. When he said, let there be a firmament, guess what? There was a firmament. And when he said, let dry land appear, nothing could inhibit his word. When it leaves his mouth, it is going to happen. And we sit and we walk daily in his creation as testimony to this. And yet we won't walk with him. We don't believe his word. We won't walk in victory. We walk in depression in fear and anxiety. And about all the things that the world tells you, rather than walking in his power. Look at Ecclesiastes, where the word of king is, there is power. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful. Everything in this book tells you the opposite of what the world's telling you or what the devil's telling you. It's complete power. A power the adversary wants to take from every one of us. From believing in that power. From believing in him. You want to increase your faith? Believe what God has said he will do. And I'm telling you, what Yeshua says in the Gospel of Matthew, that you will have faith to move mountains, that is true. It is a true statement. Problem is, most Christians really don't believe it. We love to quote it. But we really don't believe it. 2 Corinthians 
119, for the Son of God, Messiah Yeshua, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes, for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. All the promises, the Apostle Paul, he is telling these Gentiles who have been grafted in, Apostle Paul is conveying them, listen, all these promises that God has made in his word, every word he has spoken, they are yes. They're not maybe, they are not no. Where they won't happen, they are only yes through Messiah Yeshua. Every single promise. But the devil is going to come and say, mm, no. God has said, but he will not do. You can't let, no, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's for a different generation. It's not for you. All those amazing miracles and all this power of God. No, no, you don't understand. That was only for the apostolic age. That is not for this age. He's not going to do it. You know what? It's for other people. It's not for you. The miracles, the healings, that's ludicrous. This is what he does. And this is what he does best. He comes in to destroy your belief, your faith in the word. God's word is true. Period. I want to take you to Psalm 42. There's so many psalms I wanted to share with you today. I'm just giving you a glimpse, even just a portion of Psalm 42. I love the psalms because there's such vulnerability and transparency to them. In other words, we read about all these titans of faith in Scripture, about what they accomplished, what God accomplished through them. And we stand in awe. But the psalms... Shows the internal conflict, the crying out, the fear, the struggle within, the war. And I love that transparency. We need to see it. There's a reason the Psalms are in, in the Bible. Well, I want to show you what this says. This is really powerful. Psalm 42, verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. Hope in God. Now look at this. He is so transparent and so bad. He's showing you his world. And he's having this discussion with himself. My soul, look at he's He's sitting down. He's recognizing, I am a mess. A fear coming in on every side. I mean, trials and tribulations. Earlier, a couple of verses, he said, my tears are my food day and night. This man is in hell. And then he tells himself, he gets this resolve in his heart. No, I need to hope in God. He's saving his own life. And he, he's well aware of this. He is saving his own life. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. Look at how he responds to horrific trials and tribulations, to the fear. He lifts up the praise in the storm. He praises the Lord. Praise him for the help of his countenance. Then he goes on and says... Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I will remember you. I'm being destroyed. He feels the heat of the enemy coming upon him. But what does he do? He looks up. I will, I will remember the living God from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, and from the hill of Mizar. Verse 7. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. He's feeling this. This is intense war. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the day. The Lord will what? He will command. He will speak. His word will come forth. And what does it say? It brings, chesed, it brings loving kindness. This is amazing. This is what the devil doesn't want you to believe. There will be no grace. There will be no mercy for you. Your prayers are in vain. This is what he, but not this psalmist. These sons of Korah, they believe that God is their God. They believe that when he speaks, loving kindness comes. And in the night, his song shall be with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? So you, you see how it's going back and forth? He's in agony, but he responds in truth with belief. He responds with truth. Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Verse 10. 
As with the breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Understand something. This is exactly what the devil is going to do. When all these things are happening to you, but well, guess what? There looks like there's no help. And then the devil will come and say, yeah, where's this supposed God you're praying to? That is supposed to be your helper. That is supposed to be your God in a time of need. Where is he? Oh, this is so deadly. This is so deadly. The mind games, you need to see this. This is the beauty of the scriptures. They reveal the mind games the enemy is going to play at with you. And this is real. The moment you start listening to this type of rhetoric, it will be the final nail in your coffin. Just go back to the garden. Look at what Eve did. The moment she stopped believing in his word, that was it. The curse came upon her. I want to give you a few scriptural examples in addition to what we just read here and how the adversary moves. Again, God taking Israel out of Egypt. He brings them through the Red Sea, and the first thing that they end up going to, they, they, they start to break into the wilderness of Sin. And they begin to camp at Rephidim, or Massah Meribah, according to Moses. They begin to camp there. Here's the thing. There was no water. And you don't need to be a survivalist to understand that, guess what? You need water to survive. They're in the middle of nowhere, in the desert. Every single one of you would have a panic attack. In that situation, there is no water. They know their life is in jeopardy. But hold on a second. What did God say to them when he sent them a deliverer? He said he would bring them into the promised land. That's what he said. Well, you can see how the belief in that, as soon as trials and tribulations, and the belief in God's words starts to dissipate. Exodus 17, verse 7. So Moshe called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Does this sound familiar? See, in Psalm 42, when the enemy came up against the psalmist, he said, where is your God? Where is he? Now Israel is confronted with fear and with tribulation. And what are they saying? Where is our God? This is vile. This is the exact opposite way that God wants us to respond. It's the way the devil wants you to respond. This has got the devil's fingerprints all over it. It's coming in sowing fear. I'm going to tell you right now, when he sows fear successfully, it will lead to disbelief every time. There's only one way that road goes. To total disbelief. And that'll be your disconnect. That will be your nail in the coffin. And notice here what it says. They tempted. They tempted the Lord. To do this, to not believe him, is to put the Lord to test. To test him. To test him. You think of Deuteronomy 6.16? The actual command, Thou shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Well, what's interesting, read what comes after, right after it. As you tempted him and Messiah. I mean, the very birth of that commandment comes from this very place. You're not to tempt the Lord your God. We're not to fall into that. I think of the story of the ten spies. Numbers 13, going into Numbers 14. Twelve spies went to spy out the land, but ten came back, and what did they do? We know they gave a bad report. Well, what's interesting? What was the promise? God spoke. He said, his word said, I will give you the promised land. This was his word. But all of a sudden they come and the spies come back and say, we're grasshoppers in the sight of these guys. They're giants. The cities are fortified. It will be a slaughter. God has brought us here to kill us. Everything they saw in the flesh. And you know what? Any military commander there alive today would have said nothing different. Just looking at it in the flesh. Looking at it, not in the spiritual realm, not acknowledging the promises of God. There's no question Israel would have been slaughtered. See, but here's the thing. God said, his word spoke, I will bring you into the promised land. 
That is a guarantee. It cannot be thwarted except by you. Except by us individuals when we do not believe his word. And they wanted to select a leader and go back to Egypt. I ask you, did any of these men enter the land? The same fate Eve had, the same thing that she experienced, death. They died in the wilderness. Every single one of them because they didn't believe his words. Man. See, this belief in his words, everything that we read in this, it's not optional. You need to believe. Let me show you an interesting little illustration about this, just to build into what we're looking at. There's a man, he, he, was, he was actually called No Hope Carter. Listen to this story. While attending college, I visited a psychiatric institution with a group of students to observe various types of mental illness. The experience proved to be very disturbing. I remember one man who was called No Hope Carter. He was a tragic case, a victim of venereal disease. He was going through the final stages when the brain is affected. Before he began to lose his mind, this man was told by the doctors that there was no cure for him. He begged for one ray of light in his darkness, but had been told that the disease would run its inevitable course and end in death. Gradually, his brain deteriorated and became more and more despondent. When I saw him in his small barred room about two weeks before he died, he was pacing up and down in a mental agony. His eyes stared blankly and his face was drawn in ashen. Over and over, he muttered these two forlorn and faithful words, no hope, no hope. He said nothing else. No hope. Do you understand what just happened in this story? What the doctors did? See, they were looking in the flesh. They told him, there's nothing we can do for you. There is no hope for you. They spoke death into his life. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And all of a sudden, this man taking what the doctor said, of all these doctors that are well respected by men, and what were his last dying words? Pacing, no hope no hope. He died without hope. This is what the enemy is coming to do to you. And I'm not making this up. You have no idea how many couples that have sat in front of me crying because they had gone to the doctor as they are pregnant and the doctors are adamant about them having an abortion, speaking fear into them, telling them that, listen, your child's going to have a serious birth defect. You have a serious chance of Down syndrome. You have this and you have that. Don't have this child. I mean, I've prayed with couples with tears in their eyes. Every single one of them that we have prayed with have had healthy babies. Every single one. But I'll tell you, even if there was a birth defect, we believe in the words of the Lord. It doesn't matter. And the Lord said, thou shalt not kill. That's what he said. We believe in that. We got to hold fast. Do you understand how real it's getting? See, when you go into the doctor, they, they, they utilize, the enemy will utilize your surroundings. And you will look at all these people that are dying. Maybe you have the same disease. Maybe you have cancer and you see you've lost three people, you know. In my family, I have, I have family members that have died of cancer, and I have other family members that are wallowing in fear that the same fate is going to happen to them because they saw how they died. And the fear creeps in, and it controls them. And you know what it does? It leads to disbelief. Where you stop believing in the words of God. Matthew 19, 26, with God, all things are possible. Do you believe it or not? That's why I say to you again, I don't want anyone that does not have first century faith. You don't need to pray for me. Don't need to pray for me. I don't need those prayers. The only prayers I need are people that literally live in the first century. They want to walk in first century power. Where they believe without reservation. 
This is the kind of power we need to walk in. You will never walk in the power of the apostles unless you believe in the word. Okay. Amen. Second Chronicles 16, 12. A story on the heels of this no-hope carter. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet. And his malady was severe. Yet, in his disease, he did not seek the Lord but the physicians. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not anti-doctor. I believe God gives these doctors talents to save people. The moment you put your trust in them, it is over for you. It is over for you. Cursed is the man who trusts a man and makes flesh his strength. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Blessed is that man. You do not want to trust. Here you have Asa, a righteous king. He's righteous before the Lord, but then, then this tribulation hits him. He's diseased in his feet. He didn't go to God. We are supposed to go to him with all of, cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. There's a complete breakdown when we are not doing that. When we don't bring everything that we are dealing with to him, with belief and knowing, he, number one, he cares. The devil's going to tell you he doesn't. We need to pray to him, knowing he's in heaven, and he does hear. But here's what's interesting. So Asa, he's diseased in his feet. He doesn't turn to the Lord. He turns to his physicians. And what's the next statement? So Asa rested with his fathers. He died. You trust in man. This is going to be your fate. This is what's going to happen. I want to show you a beautiful promise. I want to move from that aspect into the beautiful promises that we need to believe. 2 Chronicles 7.14 If my people who are called by my name, number one, will humble themselves. Number two, pray and seek my face. Number three, turn from their wicked ways. What does it say? I will hear in heaven. Do you believe it? Do you believe the words of the Lord? If you believed it, it would drive you to your knees and repentance. It would drive you to seek ye first the kingdom of God and nothing that is in the world. Do you want the ear of the Lord? That it says, it says, he cannot deny himself. He can't deny his word. It says he will hear in heaven. There's only one thing I want. There really is, is to have the ear of Yeshua. To know that when I pray, he hears me. Well, now we've been told how to make that happen. We humble ourselves. He will not listen to anyone prideful. We pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. All those struggles, I'm going to tell you right now. All those sins that have held you in bondage that you're struggling with, you better get rid of them. Turn from, see, if you actually believe this, you're going to have the ability and the strength for deliverance. To be delivered of these things. You see people, they go through these deliverance things and they, go, and they end up back there three weeks later. And they end up back there three weeks later. I'm telling you, you want to know what the key to deliverance is? Of when you're going to Yeshua, listen to his words. Believe them. And when you believe them, you will act upon them. There is no question about it. Problem is, we are living here all day long. We are constantly filled. Our eyes are saturated with the things that are going on in the world. With all the immorality, the idolatry, all the covetousness, all the sickness and disease. Yeah, this is where depression comes from. To hold you down. Psalm 103, verse 2. Let's continue in these beautiful promises. Bless the Lord, Bruchi Nafshi at Yahweh. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And what? Forget not all his benefits. This is an interest. It's my favorite psalm. Out of all the psalms, is Psalms 103. And what the writer said is very specific. Don't forget. Why would he say, don't forget his benefits? Because that's exactly what we do. And you will find that as a common thread throughout the Tanakh. Throughout the entire Bible, this warning after warning, we forget his benefits. What are his benefits? 
who forgives all your iniquities. He forgives all your iniquities. Well, first John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. Again, do you believe the word? This is, do you want forgiveness? We have to go forward. We must confess what we know we have done wrong. And I would advise you confess the things that you don't know that you have done wrong that have displeased him. The ignorant sins. You ask the Lord to forgive those. If you confess your sins, guess what? He is faithful. Put it on your refrigerator. He is faithful. There are so many people that are so laden with sin, with so much shame over what they've done. There have been people that have literally lived their lives doing drugs, that have grown up on the streets, that, that grow up lying, cursing God. There have been women who have had abortions. And see, the enemy comes in and says, there's no hope for you. There is no hope. You went too far. You're a horrible person. Your sin can't be forgiven. It's a lie. Confess your sins. Yeshua is faithful. It will always be forgiven. Don't believe it. Don't believe the lies. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him when he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. And what's it say? Let him return to the Lord. Let him return to the Lord. And what happens? He will have mercy on him. He is faithful. He will have mercy on you. Return to him and to our God, he will abundantly pardon. There is always hope. No matter what sin has happened, we have hope. Go get it. Psalm 103, going back, I didn't finish it. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, and what else does he do? Who heals all your diseases. Notice it doesn't say he heals some of your diseases. Now, when we live in a land that is being plagued by disease, and we do, we live in a land that's being plagued by disease, I'm going to warn you right now, stop looking at all the diseases and what's happening to the world because you have hope. You have a Savior. Through God, all things are possible. He heals. No, no, it doesn't tell me here that, you know what, He heals only at particular times of the year. It doesn't tell me that he heals only at particular generations. There's only particular generations that the Lord will come forth and then he'll pour out. It's up to us to go and believe his word in our heart. And when we believe it, we will have what he says we will have. But we don't. We don't believe it. It's scary. I want to take you to Mark chapter 5. Now, when Yeshua had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea, and behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, in verse 23, and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. The first thing I want you to know is, man, this guy is a man of God. He believes what Yeshua can do. He knows what he can do. He has confessed it with his mouth. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. You have the ability to heal my daughter. Come to my house. Well, this gets interesting. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead why trouble the teacher any further? Isn't that interesting? The enemy is coming. He's coming to cast out. See, in the flesh, I'm telling you, the enemy wants to come and tell There's no hope. He came to Jairus. No, there is no hope. He's done. Don't go to prayer. Don't go to the master. He can't help you. Think about what is happening in this story and about what the adversary does to us every single day, lying to us, and we're buying into it that there's no hope. Well, how, do, how does this story end? 
Well, as soon as Yeshua heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. Do not be afraid, only believe. Again, another passage you need to put on your refrigerator. Do not be afraid. All the things that are happening in the world, all the things that are coming upon you, do not be afraid, only believe. It's the difference between life and death, forgiveness and condemnation, between whether you rise to victory or you fall in defeat. Matthew 9, 28. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Yeshua said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? These blind men have been begging to be healed by Yeshua. But he first asked, Do you actually believe that I can do this? That's an amazing thing to me. Do you believe? What did they say? Yes, Lord. Faith. They believe in his power, in what he can do. Oh, because of that, then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. And you've heard me say this how many times? According to your faith, it will be to you. Where is your faith? Do you have any? Do you actually believe the words that are written in this book? If you did, it will radically transform. You want a renewing of the mind? All you need to do is believe this book. Every single word of it. You will have a massive renewing of the mind. When you come up against trials and tribulations, the righteous will not be moved. They stand in faith. They believe. You just need to Believe according to your faith, it will be to you. Psalm 119, verse 114. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. He hopes in his word. We have been given it. The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that have been real, they belong to us. We are the richest generation in the history of the world. Do you know that? Every single one of us have access to his words. There's on cell phones everywhere. We have Bibles that used to fill the, 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 the hotels. We are the, the richest generation the world has ever known. And now you look out, we're the most wicked. How is that possible? It's crazy. I want to close with this. Ephesians 2.11, Therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called on circumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Mashiach, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. When we did not have Yeshua, there was no hope. There were no promise. All the promises, all the covenants, everything in this book, we're not yours. But what's it going to say? But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Mashiach. Because of Yeshua. Because we have hope. According to your faith, it will be to you. Let's move into our testimony for today. I got my PhD in the field of organic chemistry, postdoc at Stanford University. Joined the group of a man who was going to win a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Voted one of the top 50 most influential minds in the world. I was a visiting scholar at Harvard University. I've spoken at every major university in this country. Have over 650 research publications. Voted the R&D Magazine Scientist of the Year. I'm in the National Academy of Inventors. I'm a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Over 120 patents started seven or eight companies. We work in areas that range from medicine to material science, to electronics, computer memory, medical devices. We work across a broad range of areas. But more than any of that, what means the most to me is that I'm a Jew who believes that Jesus is the Messiah. I grew up just outside of New York City I thought everybody was Jewish. I didn't even know that there was anything else. I had no particular interest in that, other than when all my friends were getting bar mitzvahed or bat mitzvahed, and then I would attend, of course, every week. There was never really any excitement for me. I remember once I even 
tried to talk to a, a rabbi, he just brushed me off. There was very little explanation for me. I remember uh, when I went to college, I started meeting a number of people that said that they were born again Christians, which was sort of an odd term. I was, what's born again? What do you mean born again? One person saw me in the laundry room. He said, do you mind if I give you an illustration of the gospel? And I remember we sat there and he actually started to draw a picture, a cliff with a, with a man on one side and he drew a little man and then another cliff with God on the other side and a big chasm in between that he labeled with sin. And I looked at him, I said, I'm not a sinner. I've never killed anyone. I never robbed the bank. How could I be a sinner? And he had me read a verse from the Bible, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In modern Judaism, we never really talked about sin. I don't remember ever talking about sin in my home. So he turned to another passage. Jesus said, I say to you that everyone who looks upon a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Pow! I felt just as if I had been punched right in the chest. Here I was, new in college. I didn't think anybody knew. I would pick up these magazines and I became addicted to pornography. It was just through those magazines. And all of a sudden, Something that's written in the Bible, somebody from live, who lived 2,000 years ago is calling me out on it. And I felt immediately convicted and that now I realized I was a sinner. When I read in the scriptures what sin is, then I knew I was a sinner. How am I going to get to God? We Jews know this better than anyone else. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. This description in Isaiah 53 of how he will bear upon himself my sin, the things that I had done, and this was him. This was the man that took this upon himself on the cross. The perfect God comes and gives himself for us. He is the one that gives himself for us. I started to realize how Jewish the New Testament is. This book is so Jewish. The New Testament is so Jewish. It's all around Jewish people. And then on November 7th, 1977, I was all alone in my room. The realization that Yeshua is the one who died on the cross. And I said, Lord, I am a sinner. Please forgive me. Come into my life. And then all of a sudden, Someone was in my room, and I opened my eyes. I was on my knees, I opened my eyes. Who was in my room? That man, Jesus Christ, stood in my room. This amazing sense of God. Jesus was in my room, and I wasn't scared. All I started doing was just weeping. The presence was so glorious, because he was there in my room on that day. And I didn't want to get up. And this amazing sense of forgiveness just started to come upon me. That was him. Finally, I got up. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to tell. Here's this Jewish kid from New York City. What am I going to say? My cousins were shocked. How could you do that? You're Jewish. Telling my mother how I had invited Jesus into my life. She didn't say much. She was weeping. She told my father they weren't happy at all. And she said, I don't blame them for killing Jesus after the things that he said. Who is he to come against these religious leaders that have dedicated their lives to helping people and to tell them that they are whitewashed tombs? Who is he, this young man in his 30s, to say this to these scholars? He got what he deserved. And my mother's a very deep, pensive, careful reader. She read from Genesis right on through the Tanakh, the whole thing. When she got done, I said, what did you think? She said, God warned us over and over again. He warned us. 
When my daughter was about 15, my mother and father came to visit us. At one point, my mother went into her room for several hours. She came out. She said, quite a young girl you have. She talked to me for a long time. She started reading the Bible again, both the Old and the New Testament. One day, not long after that, she called me on the phone at the age of 72. She said, Jimmy, you wouldn't believe what happened. I said, what happened? She said, I was just reading, and it hit me. It hit me, the way he gave his life. I believe it now. Jesus is the Son of God.